Well, all right. It's good to be here once again for our lesson on Exodus. We're on Exodus, uh, Exodus for Beginners. This is lesson number five in that series. Uh, subtitle is Deliverance to, uh, you know, suggesting the, uh, or referring to the second attempt at deliverance and uh, God promises success. So in Deliverance one, first attempt, God equipped Moses with several signs and the request of the Pharaoh to allow the Jewish people to go for three days you know, and uh, to, uh, to worship their God. And they convinced the, uh, the leaders, uh, they meaning uh, Moses and Aaron, they convinced the, uh, uh, the Jewish uh, people that they had been sent by God and they received uh, the approval to go to the Pharaoh on their behalf it was all very positive. When they do, stating that if the Pharaoh wouldn't release them for three days, God would punish them with pestilence or the sword, to their dismay and probably surprise, the Pharaoh not only refused the request, but he accuses them of distracting the Jews from their labors and he responds by greatly increasing the difficulty of their work. Uh, he had previously provided the straw to use in the making of the uh, mud bricks uh, that they were producing for, the, for Egyptian construction. But from now on, they would have to gather the material themselves. So this caused concern and anger towards Moses since he came you know, to the Jews promising deliverance, but instead they were in a worse condition than they were before. So Moses returns to God in prayer, uh, of course, blaming God for their failure, but God instructs Moses to return to Pharaoh with Aaron to renew the request, but this time not only for three days, but, to, um, uh, but permanently, just let us go. You know, the idea of, well, we'll only go for three days and then come back. But now he says, you know, just tell the Pharaoh to release you. And so uh, we read uh, in chapter six, verses uh, 28 and forward, um, God's promise of success. He begins by promising them that they'll have success. So before the next scene begins, God summarizes what will take place and the end result as a way of building the faith and courage of Moses and Aaron. In other words, he tells them what's going to happen about the, you know, it's not going to be easy. The Pharaoh's going to reject them, but in the end, uh, they'll, will out, they'll win out and the, 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 the people of uh, Israel will be replaced. And he also explains how they will work together in confronting the Pharaoh. So note that even though his first attempt had failed, Moses didn't run away. He, he stayed uh, in Egypt. So we pick up the story in chapter six, uh, beginning in verse 28. We read the following. Now it came about on the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord, speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. But Moses said before the Lord, behold, I am unskilled in speech, how then will Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, see, I make you as God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. So some time has passed since the first audience with the Pharaoh and once again, God speaks to Moses and he repeats his instructions to go back to the monarch. Moses once again uses the excuses he gave the first time that God called him. In other words, well, I'm not a good speaker. I mean, it's just not what I do. You know, you'll have to get somebody else to do this. So God patiently explains how he will accommodate this weakness in Moses uh, and still accomplish his will. Uh, we read that God will give instructions to Moses and then Moses will relay these to Aaron who will receive them as if he were receiving them from God himself. Um, in other words, uh, 
Uh, on Aaron's part, there'll be no doubt, no suggestions, no change, no hesitation. He didn't need to be you know, convinced. He won't need to be convinced that what you're saying is from me. He'll just simply take it as you give it to him. And then he says, the Pharaoh will be the recipient of a message from God delivered by Moses through Aaron. So let's keep reading uh, in chapter seven, verse three. It says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring about my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt by great judgments. One more verse. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. Now, much has been made theologically concerning this expression, I will Pharaoh, uh, excuse me, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. That's in verse three of this passage. And uh, similar expressions we will read as we go through the episode with Moses continually demanding that the Pharaoh release the Jews and the Pharaoh refusing as the Lord hardens his heart. Now, the most common conclusion is that God negated or overrode this man's free will in order to make a point. After all, if he would have given in to Moses' demands on the very first visit, there would be no glory to God here. Just a footnote in history that uh, during the reign of so-and-so Pharaoh, the Israelites left Egypt on their way to Canaan, and that would be the end of that. So there cannot be the amazing story of the Exodus without the miraculous plagues, and there would be no miraculous plagues without the incredible stubbornness or hard-heartedness of this Pharaoh. But there's a problem. The problem here is that if God has done this, then he has forced a man against his will to do what is wrong and bring ruin to his country as well as death to countless, uh, to countless people. Now some explain this away as the unknowable sovereignty of God. In other words, we can't always understand the mind of the supreme being. From this mindset and using this and other scriptures in forming the doctrine of what's called um, unconditional election, which says that God chooses some for salvation and others for condemnation based on his own purposes and his own desires. In this case, he chose the Pharaoh for condemnation and destruction, and he used him as a prop in order to glorify himself and elevate the Jewish people as the special people of God. Well, we, I'm speaking of our class, our church as a New Testament Christians, we do not interpret this verse in this manner and neither do we draw the same conclusions from this and other verses that refer to God's sovereignty. Second Timothy, for example, uh, 1 verse 9, or John 6, 37, or Galatians 1, uh, 15. We don't draw the same conclusions uh, that uh, Calvinists, for example, draw based on the teachings uh, of the Bible concerning election or the elect. Let's stay in the book of Exodus and let's examine chapter seven, verses three and four. First of all, God was preparing Moses to face a man who because he considered himself to be a God, this is Pharaoh, would be unresponsive and stubborn. So Moses was not to be discouraged as he had been after he was rejected the first time, after having presented a perfectly reasonable you know, uh, uh, demand, request, uh, request. I mean, it's perfectly reasonable to say, look, give us three days off to worship our God. You know, 
uh, or else our God will punish us. Uh, that was not a you know, unreasonable request. The expression hardened Pharaoh's heart appears repeatedly throughout the narrative of the 10 plagues. For example, it happens or it appears in chapter nine, verse 12, chapter 10, one, uh, chapter 10, 20, 27, chapter 11, verse 10, chapter 14, verse four, verse eight, verse 17. But what does it mean? There's no explanation. Does it mean that God hardened the Pharaoh's heart against his will, not against God's will, against the Pharaoh's own will? Like the king was you know, ready to give in after the second plague, but God intervened and made him refuse to give in even when he really wanted to, because that's what, you know, that's what is suggested by the idea of election as some people interpret it. Sometimes a biblical expression suggests a conclusion that seems logical or seems to fit, but clearly contradicts the plain teaching of scripture in other passages. For example, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says that in order to be his disciple, one must hate his father and mother. Now, if we simply took that passage at face value, becoming Christians would require a serious rejection of our parents. However, we have many other passages that tell us that we should honor our father and our mother. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, for example. Or in another passage, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6, verse one. So in context, we come to understand that Jesus is telling his would-be disciples the high cost of following him by making a comparison. In following him, excuse me, if following him is against their parents' will, they must be willing to choose him over them. That's the point, that's the cost. And so back to our Pharaoh and the expression hardened his heart. When we examine other scriptures in Exodus connected to this expression, uh, 7 verse 13, 14, 22 and 23, and then again in chapter 8, 15, 19 and 32, and again, chapter 9, 7, 34, 35, when we examine those passages, we find out that the Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So what is actually happening here? Is the Pharaoh doing this or is God doing it? The answer is that both, both are doing something, but it isn't God who is overriding Pharaoh's will. First, uh, or first of all, we need to realize that while God exists outside of time and is eternal, he knows the beginning and the end of all things. In other words, he knows the final results of the choices that we make, but he does not force our choices or overrule our choices or our decisions. We have absolute free will, meaning that despite our weakened condition because of sin, we can still come to know God through the creation, through our conscience, and of course, through the revelation of scripture. In addition to knowing God, our free will also permits us to reject God if we so choose. There are many people who you know, actually believe that there is a God and you know, his word is the Bible. They, they believe, yeah, that's true, but they refuse to respond to that. They reject it. They say, no, I know it's so, but I want to do what I want to do. You know, they, they uh, exercise their free will. And as I said earlier, God is aware of our choices and their eventual outcome, but he does not force us to choose differently, but he encourages us to choose rightly through the influence of the Bible and the church and other matters. In other words, there are plenty of, um, uh, plenty of things that he has given uh, 
us uh, to encourage us to choose him, to encourage us to believe in him. He's given enough evidence of his presence and his power. He's given a revelation of himself through his uh, word. He's given us uh, the church, which is a light, uh, which is a, um, a, a human example uh, and a, a, a human presence of the spirit of Christ uh, here on earth. So there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of influences, if you wish, that work to uh, change our minds and to influence our choices. But in the end, we make the choice. We make the choice and he doesn't override the choice that we make. So what happened to the Pharaoh is explained in greater detail by Paul in the New Testament in Romans chapter one, verse 18, all the way to 32. We're not going to read all of that, but that's where Paul explains all of this. In this passage, he explains that the basic knowledge of the true God is attainable outwardly through the witness of the creation and inwardly through a person's conscience. He then explains that men are free to follow the knowledge of the true God or the way of destructive sinful behavior, denying the witness of the creation and their uh, uh, inward conscience. And he says this two times, and I just want to go to those passages. The uh, first time is in uh, Romans chapter uh, one, uh, verse 22, he says, professing to be wise, meaning you know, the general population, people who don't believe, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of incorruptible God, excuse me, the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. And then again in verse 28 repeats the idea. He says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And so here Paul is explaining, you know, people uh, have the witness of God before them, they choose to disbelieve. They choose to worship other things. They choose to worship things that God created as God, you know, birds, the sun, whatever. And in his uh, verse 28 concluding a passage there, he says, so God, you know, he lets them go. He turned them over. In other words, you want to believe that? Well, go ahead and believe that and reap the consequences of that belief. I will not override your free will. So here's where the Pharaoh uh, comes in. For those who choose the downward path, God lets them go and removes any obstacles in their journey to destruction. And the question is why? Well, he does that so that there will be no doubt as to their guilt when the time of judgment comes. So if, if we input you know, these ideas together, we see that God knew how Pharaoh would respond to him. And that of course is in defiance and disrespect. Remember, God gave the Pharaoh a great witness he demonstrated to the Pharaoh that his power was greater than the Pharaoh's power, you know, without doubt. Even when uh, his mercy, even in his mercy, God demonstrated his greater power through signs and miraculous plagues that appeared and disappeared at will. So God gave him, meaning the Pharaoh, God gave him over to the sinful, prideful stubbornness of his heart, or as Moses wrote, God hardened his heart. In other words, God knew what the Pharaoh would choose 
and he allowed him to do so, thus hardening his heart. So that through his sinful pride and stubbornness, he could demonstrate the divine power that was at work in releasing the Israelite people from Egyptian slavery. In other words, God didn't prevent the Pharaoh from believing and in so doing, you know, hardened his heart. What he did was he permitted his rebellion, which had this effect. You want to rebel? You want to maintain this prideful stubbornness that you are God, that you are greater than I? Okay, I'll, I'll permit it. I'll permit it. I'll permit your heart to be hardened and you'll have to suffer the consequences. So not only would the Jews and the Pharaoh be aware of the power of the God, of the golden thread that we're talking about, uh, all of Egypt would be made aware of the God of the Jews. So we read in Exodus uh, chapter seven, verses six and seven. So Moses and Aaron did it as the Lord commanded them, thus they did. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Exodus chapter seven, verse six and seven. So this section closes with a parenthetical statement to end the summary with the notation that Moses and Aaron did all that the Lord would command them to do in the future. And it notes their ages at the beginning of their service to God. Moses was 80 and Aaron was 83. Well, let's stop here uh, uh, for now. And I'd like to draw a couple of lessons from not just these passages, but from the ideas that we've talked about. Lesson number one, God can still turn you over to sin if that's what you choose. God still does that. That wasn't a one-time thing with the Pharaoh. If you choose to sin knowingly, if that's what you choose, then God will turn you over to that sin. This feature of God's dealings with man is still in operation today. As I said, it, it's not limited to Old Testament characters. Uh, look at the differences between Saul and David, for example, the first two kings of the Jewish nation. King Saul began giving in to his impulsive and impatient nature not far into his reign. For example, he didn't wait for Samuel to offer the sacrifice, but offered it himself, which was not allowed in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13. And so God rightfully punished Saul by taking the kingdom away from him. In other words, it meant that his successor would not come from his own family. If we continue reading about Saul's life, we don't see a humble repentance. Uh, we don't see an effort to be more obedient to God, more faithful to God in his service. After all, God allowed Saul to continue to reign over Israel a total of 40 years. We read about that in 1 Samuel 13. What we do see is that Saul hardened his heart against God and against God's judgment by carrying on an effort to destroy David when he learned that David would reign in his place one day and not his own son, Jonathan. And God permitted him to do so to the point that Saul descended into madness by the end of his life and his reign. When we read about David and his life, one episode really stands out, and that is his sins with Bathsheba, one of his uh, military commander's uh, wife. Uh, Uriah was uh, the man's name. We read about him in 2 Samuel 11. And this is a familiar story. Uh, we're familiar with David's conduct, which included adultery with this man's wife, and then murder, he had the man killed, and then the cover-up 
to hide his crimes. God also called David out and punished him for his sins. The baby that he conceived with Bathsheba died and there was continued upheaval in his family thereafter. But David did not harden his heart against God by disregarding God's commands and further reveling in sexual sin or in other worldly debaucheries. On the contrary, he humbled himself and he mourned over his bad behavior and all that it cost him. As a matter of fact, he even wrote a beautiful Psalm to commemorate the entire experience. And I think it's, it's worth our time to read a portion of that Psalm. It's Psalm 32. It says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Well, right away, we know the he, he's talking about himself. The transgression, well, all the sins that he had committed uh, and the forgiveness is the forgiveness that God uh, gave him uh, through Nathan the prophet. Uh, Nathan the prophet told him that God had forgiven him. So he says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Then he kind of you know, tells his own story. He says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah, Selah is a uh, literary device. Uh, it means to pause. You know, pause and reflect on what has been said. He continues to say, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin, Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance, Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, uh, in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. I, I want you to note very quickly uh, the three phases of David's experience as he is writing this poem. First, the suffering, the suffering that he uh, experienced because of his guilt, the guilt uh, uh, on his conscience uh, pressed upon him, made him sick at heart, even uh, sick uh, physically. And then the relief, the relief and the joy that he felt at being forgiven for these sins and knowing that God had forgiven him and having accepted that forgiveness. And then the third uh, part is a resolution, uh, not only to not repeat those sins, but further than that, a resolution to teach others uh, about and through his own experience. You know, a little bit like uh, alcohol, uh, alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, the, the guys uh, stand up and say, I'm an alcoholic and they tell their story and they help the other people with their difficulties and their uh, addictions. Well, he's kind of saying the same thing, you know, I, I want to teach others what happened to me and how I resolve this and how good the Lord is and so on and so forth. And so the Pharaoh and Saul, are good examples of what happens to people 
who come face to face with God, but they refuse to acknowledge or to submit to him. The experience of resisting him has the effect of hardening their hearts. Or another way of saying this, resisting him affects us by lessening our ability to believe in all spiritual things. David, on the other hand, is an example of what true repentance can do. It softens our hearts before God, enabling us to obey more easily in the future. It opens our eyes to see the goodness of God more clearly. How wonderful it is when we accept and experience forgiveness and, and, and what, a, what a different view it gives us of who God is. It really enables us to connect with his mercy and his kindness for having forgiven us. And then of course, it enables us to receive the grace of God for our sins. You know, David committed adultery and murder, yet he was able to continually praise and serve God for the rest of his life. I mean, think about that. Uh, many people, even if they are forgiven for it, uh, you know, they won't forgive themselves. They're broken, they're, you know, they, they can't go on because their failure is so great that uh, it ruins the rest of their lives. David, however, was able to get in touch with that forgiveness. He was able to rejoice in it and, and able to write you know, these beautiful Psalms despite the terrible things that he had done. Well, we have received absolute free will from God, which means that we can choose to believe him or we can choose to disbelieve or resist him. These stories of the Pharaoh and Saul and David illustrate the working and the consequences of our free will choices. Choosing to resist or to reject or to disbelieve God has a hardening effect on our hearts, a, a searing effect on our own consciences. That's why there are very few deathbed conversions. I know we read about those or people you know, hope for those, but someone who has chosen to resist God all his life also resists him in death. On the other hand, choosing to let God in Choosing to believe and consequently to obey him as a unique effect on our absolute free will. With time, the believer comes to the point uh, that he wants his will to be in concert with God's will. With uh, time, um, he wants to do what God wants him to do. It's the thing he wants the most or she wants the most. Absolute free will is the only thing that actually belongs to us. And at some point in a believer's life, he offers to God the one thing that is, that is his to give, and that is his will. Very much like Jesus, our faith ultimately leads us to say, not my will, Father, but let your will be done. In the end, our absolute free will uh, has been given to us so that we can offer it to God. And when we do, it produces several things. First, a sincere and maximum love for God. It also produces true spiritual discernment and knowledge. And of course, joy, peace, rest in Christ, our Lord and Savior. All right, so that's a first uh, lesson I think we can draw from there. Here's lesson number two. With God, it's never too late to be useful. You know, Aaron uh, came from relative obscurity in the late portion of his life to become the first high priest of the Jewish nation. Moses had experienced two lifetimes, one as the son of an Egyptian princess, one as a shepherd in Midian. Uh, 
when God sent him off on what seemed an impossible mission as he entered the last third of his life. On a personal note, when I was 60 years old, um, when most people, you know, they start thinking about retirement and slowing down, I'd already been preaching for 30 uh, years. So I'm 60 years old and you know, this young guy, Hal, my son-in-law, a member of the church, you know, all of a sudden uh, we put our heads together and uh, I make the Bible talk material available uh, on YouTube for the very first time. I didn't even know what YouTube was in, in those days. I just taught the Bible classes and Hal did all of the technical stuff online. Well, this is you know, our 15th year on YouTube. And since we started, close to 20 million people have viewed our materials and many have passed them on to others. We get, uh, you know, we get all kinds of reports, but uh, they send us a, you know, uh, a tracking um, reports uh, from YouTube. And uh, this is one of their tracking reports, you know, the Bible talk statistics, new subscribers uh, this month, the month that we're in, uh, 3,400 new subscribers, new people who subscribe, meaning that whenever new material comes out, uh, they get a notification or they receive our newsletter or they receive information from us. Uh, we have at, the, at this time, I don't know, I, I can't keep track of it, it keeps changing all the time, but nearly 150,000 subscribers. Um, this month, uh, 609,000 views. Uh, for our uh, website and for uh, YouTube, uh, 20, million, uh, 20 million views um, that we have uh, had. And this is for a very, you know, a simple, simple Bible teaching class that we offer just as we offer in every Church of Christ. I'm just one of the thousands of Church of Christ ministers who teach Bible classes on Sundays and Wednesdays. But through the power of the media, we've been able to you know, multiply the number of individuals who hear, who see, uh, who even download, copy and distribute to their own churches and to their own communities, the material that we have. And so the lesson here is that God is not limited uh, by what you're limited with. Your faith and your obedience is what he needs to create a work or a ministry or a service to others in his name. Just remember that what limits you does not limit him. What holds you back does not hold him back. I thought my career was pretty much finished, you know, on the, on the decline. I had my good years, I had my young years. It was only starting because my limitations, my age and so on and so forth, were not his limitations. He can do great things with little things. Okay, well next week, uh, I want you to, if you haven't already, I want you to read uh, chapter seven to chapter 12 in, um, in Exodus. We're gonna start uh, talking about the plagues and I'm gonna give you a chart. You have a chart in your workbooks and we're gonna start filling out that chart with all the information about the plague. So I thank you for your attention this week. I pray that God blesses you. And if the Lord is willing, we'll see you again for uh, lesson number six.